the book of 1 Peter. We've been looking at some things in 1 Peter. And uh, we was looking at how to have a consecrated life. We know in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, he said, Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Then he said, Be ye holy, for I am holy, uh, saith the Lord. Be ye holy, for I am holy. We know these things here. Uh, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The Old Testament, it said, Be ye holy, because I am holy, saith the Lord. And uh, so we find that, that truth. Is, and we look at the, the, to have a consecrated life, a holy life, you need to have a consecrated mind. And we looked at you need to have a consecrated memory. What you remember. Remember where you were with before Christ. Remember the conversion you have in Christ. Remember the price paid by Christ. Those kind of things. And, and we can go back and go over all that. And then we came to this consecrated ministry. The consecrated ministry. And we saw three things in the consecrated ministry. Number one, we found that there was a laying aside of sin. A laying aside of sin. And uh, we ought to, chapter 2, he says, we're, we're laying aside all malice and all God. And we remember that it's about the heart sins, not just the hand sins. That the heart, uh, the hands work what's in the heart. And uh, when the mouth speaks within the heart, matter of fact, he said he deals with that, and all evil speakings, to lay aside all evil speakings, and now the both of the heart, the mouth speakings. We know this to be true. You do what's in your heart. You live like your heart is. As a man is in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so we found that God dealt with that consecrated ministry is a laying aside of sin. And in this last Lord's Day, we dealt with this idea of living in the Scriptures. Living in the Scriptures. And we dealt with that. We dealt with two sides of that. We dealt with the, uh, the method for the method. Remember we dealt with the, we were dealing with the ministry of a consecrated uh, you know, a consecrated ministry, but we dealt with the consecrated method to get into this whole thing was in salvation, and we dealt with that idea that he makes the statement, uh, um, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, verse number three. And remember how we went back and showed that that tasting had to do with the first time you ever had a taste of the trueness of God. Uh, in salvation, and we went back to chapter 1 and dealt with being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which is which uh, liveth forever and uh, or abideth forever. We, we dealt with that, that idea right there of how the, there is the, the seed of the Spirit, that incorruptible seed that, of God moving inside of us. And there's the uh, sounding forth of the, the Scriptures. Remember the, those things. That happened at salvation. That is how we got saved. But that's not only how we got saved, but that's how we are sanctified. That is our lifestyle. That is our ministry to continue in the same things which we started out in. Continue in the things. Continue in the faith like we started out in this. He tells us if we're going to grow, we need to be as newborn babes. Desiring the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. That's how we ought to live our life. Desire the sincere milk of the Word. And we dealt with the idea of the, the sincerity or the pureness of the Scriptures. And we dealt with the idea of the, the palatableness of the Scriptures. They're milk. And they're so simple. Most of the time, we make them more difficult than we need to. Now, I am not begrudging the idea of studying and getting into the deep things of God. There are deep things of God. There are There is meat in the Scriptures. And you and I ought to be uh, growing older. As we grow older in the Scriptures, we ought to, in our Christian life, get into the meat. We ought, not, we ought not be like those ones that he talks about in Hebrews chapter 5 when they ought to be teachers that need have, need have someone teach them again. They're still, they ought to be having a meet, but they have still need to 
the meal. We ought to be able to eat of the meat, but we ought to enjoy the meal. I tell you this, you might not believe this, but I like a glass of cold milk. I like it. I enjoy milk. Now, I, can like, I, I eat meat, but I enjoy milk. I, as a matter of fact, I like getting some of that uh, syrup in there, that chocolate syrup to make a chocolate meal, or get some strawberry syrup in there to make it strawberry. And I like cookies, too. Now, y'all know that. I don't eat cookies very often, but I like I like milk and cookies. I like those sweet things, those things that are palatable. Hallelujah. And so I'm not begrudging us. We ought to search the scriptures, study to show ourselves approved. But we ought to enjoy the sincere meal of the word. Just like a baby enjoys that sincere meal, we ought to enjoy a sincere meal that we may grow thereby. And then we see, uh, not only do we find live, uh, laying aside sin and living in the scriptures, but we find this other thing is loving on the Savior. And he deals with this, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And then he goes on to deal with this idea to whom coming in the living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And I want to look at this idea of loving on the Savior. And I want to look at this thought here tonight. Our value before Christ. Our value in Christ and the value of Christ. I want to look at it from this portion of Scripture right here, uh, this part right here where it says, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed on, on, of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder is disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are chosen generation of royal priesthood, and holy nation of peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous a light. Our Father, we thank you for letting us read the Scripture. Let us have the Scripture. Now, Lord, I pray, God, you would enlighten them to us. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy word. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So I want us to look at this thing. Now, here's the world keeps telling us that we ought to look at our self-value and our value to society or societal value. But the truth is, I will say this real simple, until we find ourselves of no value, we will never accept Christ and His full value. And that is a, a, a quick statement to get you to understand what we want to deal with tonight. We will deal with our self-value and our value to society, our societal value. And then we will deal with salvation value and the value of our sovereign and Savior. So I want to look at our value in and of ourselves and our value to society. Here's what God says. For all flesh is as grass, verse 24, chapter 1, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof fall the way. Do you see that? Our value is of no more value to this world than grass is. It covers up things for a little while. And it's there for a little while and it faded away, withered away. It goes away. Your value in this world is, first of 
all, it's very temporal. Let me say this. It's very timid. It's timid. That's the word that means it's not a very fragile type. It's, it's, it's not going to last long. It's temporal. It's fragile. Do you understand if the heat rises, the sun comes up, and the grass withers? If it does not get enough water, it withers. I lived in Texas for 16 years. We had to water the grass in our front yard of the church because it, it, it would get hot in the summer. Now, the, two weeks earlier, it could have been flooded by because it would be uh, torrential rains because it was uh, tropical storms and hurricane season. But then you go two weeks later and you start seeing the grass drying up in the same place that it was flourishing. Why? Because it cannot sustain itself. It is very temporary. And I say that because your self-value, you ought to look at yourself as, I am very temporal. Everything I do, everything I have, everything I am will not last. I'd ask the question, and I, I, I could probably ask my son, he might know this, but who had the best record in baseball in 1987? I just picked a number, a year. That wasn't very long ago. That was only 33 years ago. 33 years ago. Who had the best record in baseball? Nobody knows. You know very few people that even lived that, that day and age and that they played baseball in those days that are still alive and going. And their names might be in the Hall of Fame somewhere, but they're not remembered for much. I'm trying to get you to understand. That is how our societal value goes. It's temporary. Our self-value is very temporary. We're just dying people. I'm not talking about being dead in trespasses and sins. I'm talking about physically dying what? I take grass and we cut it and we throw it away. Is that what you do with your grass? You either leave it out there in the yard to blow away or you put it in a bag to throw away. Now if you live way out in the country, you might bundle it up and burn it up. But you're not keeping the grass. It's of no value. Is that true? And yet, our flesh is as grass, the Bible tells us. Paul tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 7, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Nothing good about you. He tells in Isaiah 64, verse 6, the prophet says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. We're fading. We're going away just like a leaf. What good are we? What good are we when it comes to eternity? From an eternal view, what good are we in and of our flesh? I say this, that's our value without Christ. Then I find the value of Christ. The value of Christ. And here's what he tells us. This is what he says now. Here, here, here's what he says. Um, he says he's gracious. The, verse number 3 of chapter 2. The Lord is gracious. He said he's a living stone. And he says he's chosen of God and precious. Do you see that? Verses number 3 and 4. Those are things that the value of Christ, the Bible calls him precious of great value. Matter of fact, he goes on to tell us that he's the chief cornerstone. He's the chief cornerstone. Elect and precious in verse number 6. Again, we will find that word precious. And then he goes on, he 
Verse 7, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. That word precious means of super duper value. Of such a great value that you can't put a, a number on. You say, how valuable is that? More valuable than the diamond that you might be wearing. It might be, it's more valuable than what you the, than the hairdo you get. It's more valuable than everything you own. He is valuable. He's of great value. Matter of fact, he's of that pearl of great price. Where somebody goes out and finds it, they go sell all they have that they might go buy the field that they might have that pearl. That's how valuable he is. He is worth everything you have. And to us who believe, he is that wise. He is precious. I say the value of Christ. The value with our value without Christ. The value of Christ. And then I find our value in Christ. Here's what he tells us, and this is where we're getting right back to our scripture. I'm trying to keep in our scriptures tonight. Here's what he says. Ye also, verse number five, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. He tells us our value is as a lively stone. Now, he is valued as, as a living stone. A living stone because he has life in himself. But we are lively stones because we get life from him. That's our value as, as an in Christ. As a saved person, our life comes from him. He is a lively or a living stone, so he has life to give us life so we can be lively stone. I'm alive in Christ. That's great value. Life is a great value. How much do you think people spend year after year after year to keep themselves alive? I would hate to have to ask you how much you pay for heart medicine. How much you pay for blood pressure medicine? How much you pay for gym membership? How much do we pay? I, what is really a sad thing is I know some people that spend that much money for their dogs to stay alive. But I tell you, life is of a great value and he is alive and gives us life. So I find our value in Christ is as a lively son. Let me say this. Our life in Christ is as a spiritual house. A spiritual house. And yet, the foundation stone is Jesus Christ himself. Is that not what he said? Chief cornerstone, elect, precious. That means he is our foundation and our fixation of what we are built upon. The foundation of God standing sure. But not only this, there is no other, no other foundation laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is our foundation stone. He is our fixation stone. And I'm saying this about Him. He is everything we have is in Him as far as being built up in the most holy faith. He is, he is solid as our foundation. The chief cornerstone has to be solid. You say, what do you mean? Well, everything above it rests on it. Everything, but not only does it have to be solid, but it has to be square. Could you picture if you took the cornerstone and it kind of had an angle on it and everything was built off of that and so it started building out this way and in this way or out that way. No, it has to be a square stone. The cornerstone is a solid stone because everything rests on it. But not only is it a solid stone, but it is a square stone. It has to be square. And Jesus Christ is a square stone. He's a solid stone. Matter of fact, he's dry stone according to what Isaiah tells us. We find him as a solid stone. We are a spiritual house. 
but he is a solid stone. He is a square stone. He is a smooth stone. Because if you put him on, if you put something on top of something that's not smooth, you know what it does? It wobbles. But Jesus Christ has got a smooth surface for the foundation that let, that it stand is sure. Everything that rests on Him is on a solid foundation, on a sure foundation, oh, a squared foundation, a smooth foundation. I just want you to understand the value of Christ. Try building a house without squaring. Try building a house without having a solid place to build on. Try building, a, try building a house when you're not smooth or plain the wood per se. On wood that's not being plain and it's just wobbly and everything. Try building a house like that. It cannot be, it cannot stand, it cannot stay. So we find our value in Christ is in a spiritual house. As lively stones, our life goes from Him. Uh, as, as a foundation, uh, He is our foundation, He's our fixation, and we are built upon Him and around Him. Everything. But then we are built a spiritual house. You'll notice He's elect of God. Elect, precious. He's called the chosen of God. Our value in Christ. We are a chosen uh, people, a, a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. Uh, we're, we are a holy nation, a peculiar people. Our value in Christ, because He is chosen, the elect, we are chosen in Him. That's the only place we have election. There is nobody elect to Christ. We are elect in Christ. We're chosen in Him, not to Him. The Calvinists get that all messed up. They try to choose us to Christ. No, our choice, the chosen place is in Christ. Now, I'm not getting into all of how we get into Christ, except for that we call upon the name of the Lord and we're saved. And He draws upon our hearts. I'm not negating the fact of His drawing and our calling. I don't get rid of one to have the other. I just want you to understand that the place of election for a Christian is in Christ, not to Christ. The place of choosing as a, of a Christian is in Christ, not to Christ. We are chosen to serve. We are chosen to do what God would have us to do. A chosen generation. What I'm going to tell you is the value of Christ. If there was no Christ, who died for our sins and would not have done it all. There was no precious stone as Christ is, a precious person as Christ is. There would not be a place for us in Christ. And therefore we'd be doomed, we'd be damned. Our value in Christ. Let me just say this. He's precious. The Bible tells us. But the Bible tells us about us. We're made acceptable by Him. Is that not what it says in verse number 5? A royal priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We're a spiritual house that makes... And we are people that make for acceptable sacrifices because we're accepted in Christ. We're made acceptable by Christ. There's nothing else that makes us acceptable. I am accepted in the beloved according to Ephesians chapter 1. That's my acceptance. I want to talk about the value of Christ and our value in Christ. We have no value outside of Christ. But we have extreme value in Christ. We're a holy nation, a peculiar people. Oh, zealous of good works, the Bible tells us. We're called out of darkness into His marvelous light. 
I want you to understand. Oh, will not be confounded. The Bible says, He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. What's that word mean? Well, I want to explain it to you. Verse number 6. That word confounded, that has to do with will not be put to shame. Will stand in the judgment. Y'all know, Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walk not in count the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sin the sin is scornful, but if the light is in the law of the Lord and his heart, and meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water, and, and bring forth spring fruit in the season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like a chaff, the wind drives away of no value. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But we're a peculiar people, and I'm telling you, we'll not be confounded. We'll stand in the judgment. We'll be in the congregation. Hallelujah. When it's all said and done, amen, we'll not be put to shame. Which in time fact, we're not a people, but now are the people of God. Our place in Christ. Our value in Christ. We are the people of God. We have obtained mercy. I want us to just look at these verses and start thinking about the value outside of Christ of no value. The value of Christ of all value. And our value in Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Of great value. I say all that to get you to understand all our value comes from the one, the one who is all valuable. Which in time passes on. Let me give you this thought. So if Christ is all value, and we are complete in Him. Christ is the fountain of our life. He's a supplier and sustainer of life. Christ is the foundation and fixation of our building. Christ is the elect within whom we are elect. Our election is in him. And Christ is the valued one who makes us valuable. The world keeps looking at self-value and societal value. Whereas until we see ourselves of no value, we will never know Christ and his full value. For unto you believe he is precious. I want you to understand everything about Christ. And it's all found in one simple truth. Precious. One word. Precious. Of more value than anything else. He's a pearl of great price that you said everything you have to have him to understand his full value. The problem is the problem is, we think of ourselves with some value. I'm not that valueless. Everybody has value, and I'm not begrudging that in an earthly mindset. But the truth of the matter is, in an eternal mindset, nobody has any value except for Christ. And so if you don't have Christ, you're without value. And if you look at yourself as without value, instead of esteeming yourself as having value, then you would not look at other people as of, of less value than you. You won't get rid of racism. Hey, realize you have no value. You want to get rid of humanism? Realize that you're of no value. You're, you're, that means everything you think, except for Christ Himself, is of no value. Everything you do, except for in Christ, is of no value. And guess what? Let Him have full value. And then you'll esteem others better than you say. You'll not think so highly of yourself. You'll not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. I'll not think more highly of myself than I ought to think. Father, I thank you for today. Thank you for being of such great value in Christ. 